Pleasant good morning. Good morning. Hey, happy morning to everybody. Let me pull out my magic wand. Okay. So as you've noticed in our scripture reading, it's somewhat familiar or almost the same with that of last week about fishermen. So this morning we will be talking about a uh, fisherman's tale of success. Okay. Now, thank, uh, thank you for the scripture reading a while ago. And uh, let us go back to John chapter 21. Let us begin with verse 1. So we could uh, have a glimpse of what's been, uh, what's going on with, uh, with John chapter 21. Let's begin with verse 1 and 2 and 3. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It had happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples, they were together. I am going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night, they caught nothing. So during that night, Peter went out and uh, with fellow disciples, they uh, went with him. But unfortunately, they had no catch. Now, in our scripture reading, early in the morning, verses five, six, uh, 4, 5, and 6, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net because of the large number of fish. Now, I want all of us to notice that they did not recognize that it was Jesus speaking. Now, those in the red marks did not realize that it was Jesus. Now, when the stranger, when this particular stranger told them to cast their net on the right side, they followed this particular stranger, a complete, <clears throat> a complete stranger. Okay. They follow. Now why? Why is it? It says that it, they did not realize that it was Jesus. But when this complete stranger asked them to cast their net on the right side, and then they did. So why? Now it was thought that this stranger had been observing them from the shore when they were casting out their nets and catching fish. He was observing from the shore and somehow had seen a shoal of fish, a uh, congregation of fish. Because at times, fish can be seen in a dense masses. They congregate. Okay. And probably at the shore, he noticed that the fish were at the right side of the boat. And notice also that uh, somehow Peter and the disciples, they did not uh, cast the net on the right side. So this particular stranger, he was observing them. Okay? And uh, when they were out, okay, again, it was probably observed that Peter and the disciples, they were just casting the nets uh, in front and to the left side. So the, this observant, this stranger, noticed it, and he saw probably a shoal of fish on the right side. So he told them, Go out and cast the net to the right side. Okay. And, you know, again, Peter, they were a seasoned fisherman. They have known, they have, they have known you know, what, uh, they knew what to do. And uh, as experts, they normally go out, fish, catch, uh, cast the nets, left, front, right, back. But at this time, 
this time, probably they forgot to cast the net to the right side. Okay? And now they are taking a, an, an advice from a complete stranger. Now, the difference with Luke chapter 5, with our lesson last week, okay? Peter, in Luke chapter 5, he took a chance on Jesus Christ because he knew that it was Jesus. Okay? He knew that it was Jesus. But this time around, in John chapter 21, he had no clue who this person was. Okay? So lesson number one. Lesson number one. Success demands listening. It pays to listen. It pays to listen. In Mark chapter 6, verse 2, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many, hearing him, were astonished, saying, Where did this, this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? So they were astonished at Jesus Christ. They were astonished because... Of what? Verse 3. Is this not the carpenter? They were astonished because Jesus Christ is not known to be a rabbi at that time. Okay. He was known as a carpenter's son. The son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. So they were surprised and astonished at his wisdom and knowledge because he was not a graduate of any Bible school, so to speak, at that time. And he was not a student of any known rabbis. He was a carpenter's son. Okay? So they were offended because here he was, a carpenter's son, teaching them in the synagogue. Right? Instead of somebody... A non-rabbi should have, should have stand up, stood up, and preached to them. But no, here, here was a, a carpenter's son. And to them, it was an insult. That's why they were offended. Okay? They never heard the name Jesus. Being a, uh, a student of any known rabbis, and uh, there he was speaking to them, and they were astonished. It probably someone from a well-known family that uh, stood before them and spoke before them, they would not be offended. But a carpenter's son with no theological degree whatsoever, that was offensive to them. Okay? But look, Jesus' words astonished them because he had wisdom. You see, my dear brethren and friends, from time immemorial, our eyes are set on credentials. Our eyes and our hearts are set on status symbols. We are prone to listen and take notice of, of some people with much higher degrees and much higher status than us. Okay. Somehow we tend to, to brush off, you know, to brush off their words because I am better than him. I am more educated than him. I have more diplomas hanging on my, on my walls than him. So he should be listening to me. I should not be listening to you. See? Well, of course, in some specific areas like legal matters, you have to consult your, your lawyers. You have to go to them, of course. But in matters of life in general, my dear brothers and sisters, it won't hurt to listen to people, whatever their status in life is. Just listen to what they have to say. Okay? Open your heart and open your mind to the possibility that you may learn something. And you will never know. It might save your life in the process. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 20 to 21. Paul said, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. It was a rhetorical question by Apostle Paul. Where is the wise? Now he was asking, where, where, is the, where are those that are great and vast knowledge of man? Where is the scribe? The great Jews, the rabbis, where are they? Where is the, uh, the philosopher? You know, the disputer, the debater, the Greeks, 
the wisdom of the Greeks. You know, with, with this all so-called wisdom and vast knowledge that we have, that they have, it failed to recognize God. They failed to recognize Jesus Christ. They failed to recognize the cross with all their wisdom. And this so-called learned people, they didn't understand who Jesus was. They hated him. And they saw Jesus as a fool. But to the ordinary people, this so-called foolishness of Jesus was accepted by them. That's why God was pleased to save them. The foolishness of the cross was a saving grace for the foolish individuals. Those who were called foolish at that time. Now in 23, 22 and 23 of 1 Corinthians, Jews demand signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified as stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The Jews wanted to, uh, to believe in, in Jesus by his signs. Okay? The wonders, the miracles that Jesus uh, would show them. They would rather believe in Jesus Christ if they show them something that is visible rather than to have genuine faith in Jesus Christ. They want tangible evidence as experienced by their forefathers. Example, when, when God parted the Red Sea. They wanted to see that kind of miracle so that they could believe and they would believe Jesus Christ. But, you know, they could not see anything glorious on the cross except an ordinary man crucified. That is so unfortunate, having all those wisdom. Now, Jesus would not give in to their requests and to their wishes to please them. He will not give it to them. In Matthew chapter 12, we read, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Jesus replied, A wicked and adulterous generation demands a sign, but none will be given except the sign of prophet Jonah. You see, and they saw the cross a stumbling block. They knew by the Jewish tradition, they knew that God would send, would send a savior from among them. But, you know, the sight of an ordinary man whose death was considered something heinous, it was a stumbling block for them. A sight of an ordinary man born with animals in the manger, it was not what they were expecting. And that was hard for them to accept. They were hoping for something regal. They were hoping for someone kingly. They were hoping for someone majestic in stature that would come and save them. Born of a well-known family. You know what? But Jesus had none of those. He had none of those. Then the Gentiles, on the other hand, searched for wisdom. Wisdom. They could not comprehend any wisdom for someone to die a cruel death on the cross for the account of someone. For them, that's foolishness. They don't see any wisdom in that. The idea of a crucified Savior was contrary to their wisdom. They believe that gods are immortal. And the idea of somebody like Jesus Christ claiming to be God and dying on the cross is incomprehensible to them and they will not allow it and they will not take that and they will not understand that claiming to be God and there you are on the cross dying dead it was incomprehensible so the cross was foolishness to them you see how people again with so much status in life with so much knowledge with so much learning Acquired over the years, they just brush off the words of Jesus Christ. They saw him as fool. But the ordinary, they listened to him and they were saved. And God was pleased to save them. So it pays to listen. 
whatever status we are, whatever status they are, it doesn't hurt to listen. You know, as we always say, you know, take and eat the meat and throw the bones, right? Throw the bones. Listen with curiosity. Listen with curiosity. Don't just listen with the intent to reply. Listen to understand. Listen for what you can get behind the words. Most of the successful people I've known are those who do more listening than talking, according to Bernard Baruch. Never stop listening. The moment you stop listening, you start limiting your success, according to Lillian Smith. It pays to listen, especially to Jesus Christ. Now, later we will see that success, what success awaits those fishermen as they listen to this a total stranger. So listening is important. Listen. Now, second, part of listening, it involves great humility, which brings us to the second lesson from this story. A teachable spirit. Help. A teachable spirit. What does it mean? You see, all the fishermen, they were all, Peter and the rest of the team, they were all professional fishermen. Everything about the trade they knew. And this particular day, it puzzled them why there was no catch. And when they cast the net to the right side, there was a huge catch. See? You see, what was asked of them was not different from what they normally do. They normally go out, cast the net to the right, to the left, and to the front. But at this particular day, they did not cast the net to the right. Okay? But when Jesus told them, when this total stranger told them to cast the net to the right side as they did, it teaches us to have a teachable spirit. Okay? Oftentimes, those that, those that have the most in life are harder to teach, as they say. They don't need help anymore. I am a made man. I am a made person. I do not need any help. They feel that they are sufficient in themselves. They don't want to listen because they think they already knew and know everything. The teachable spirit is what the Bible refers to as being poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit, my dear brethren and friends, it is not a call to actual poverty. No. Or to give out your fortune. No. But if you'll give it to me, I will accept it. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that you are financially broke when you are poor in spirit. No. It is a call for admittance of spiritual bankruptcy. It means that we cannot survive without the help of God. That you and I cannot survive without God. And that is what is meant by being poor in spirit. The apostles, you know, they, were, they were out fishing. They needed to have food to put on the table. Now, since they are in need, they, they listen to a total stranger's advice. They need all the help that they can get. They probably you know, said to each other, you know, we have no catch. We have no food. You know, this guy might be right. We, we, we probably didn't really cast the net to the right side. We forgot about that. So it's probably good to listen to him. He makes sense. So let's go out. Let's go out again and cast the net. And when they did, they had a huge catch. You see, this attitude is what is meant by poor in spirit. You needed help. You needed God in the course of your life. Even though you have everything, you see yourself as dependent on God. A teachable spirit is opening your heart to listening to God. In Psalm 37 verse 4, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give the desires of thine heart. Do you remember when I made a lesson about Psalm 37 verse 4? The word delight. Delight is you put your happiness in the Lord. And how do you do that? Delight means pliable means being soft. Okay? If you will remember the illustration that I did 
when I gave the coin to Brother Charles at that time, and I gave him a piece of tissue, a napkin, see, like this one, this is a rectangular, right? If I give this to Brother Joe, and if can you make another uh, shape out of this, Brother Joe? It will be pro it will be hard because this is not pliable, this is not so. But if I give him a, a piece of paper or a table napkin, uh, he can uh, make a triangle, make a square, make a rectangle out of that. And that's what delight means, being pliable in the hands of God, being able to be molded in what God wants you to be. You see, a teachable spirit is being pliable in the hands of God, able God to do what he wants to you. And then he said that he will give you the desires of their heart. And that's what teachable means. Being poor in the spirit, being teachable in the spirit. Okay. Israel Moore Ayivor said, just be silent, humble and teachable. If you ever think you know it all, that is the beginning of your troubles. Shannon Alder said, happiness is always on the other side of being teachable. And that is right. You see, when the apostles, uh, when, when Peter and the disciples, okay, they listened to this total stranger and they listened to him, to him. You see, being teachable, happiness is always at the other side. At the right side, there was happiness. There was a huge catch. Being teachable. You see, they tried all they can to catch fish all night, but they failed. And they were asked to cast the net on the other side, the right side. This is to a change, a call to change one's approach and one's perspective in life when the usual thing seems to fail. See, don't expect a different result by doing the same thing over and over again. That is insanity. Right? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is insanity. Teachable spirit is doing other things when you are not successful in what you've been doing. You've been living your whole life without Jesus Christ, without truly accepting him in your life. And we know that when we die without Jesus, we will die eternally in hell. Then we ask, do you want to go to heaven? And the majority would say a resounding yes we want we all want to go to heaven but but we keep on living the same life every day without jesus christ then how can you expect a different result and go to heaven it doesn't make sense that is insanity having a teachable spirit means right now you accept the Lord in your heart. You come to Him. Because you've been living your life, your whole life, without God, without Jesus Christ. And yet, you want to go to heaven. And this time around, you change your perspective. You accept the Lord and come to Him. And expect a different result this time. Because you now have the Lord. Try Jesus. Try Jesus. You can't go wrong with God. You can't go wrong with Jesus Christ. Okay. Apostle Paul had everything before he became Jesus' servant. Now, I will not go into details uh, of his social and economic uh, status before he became the servant of Jesus Christ. But according to Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned that the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in one. This verse somehow suggests that Paul had the good life. Right? He had the good life even before he met Jesus Christ. Okay? Paul was willing to let go of what he had, the good life, 
for Jesus Christ. He knew that by living the same life over and over again without Jesus Christ, he would never have heaven. If you keep on living your life over and over again without Jesus Christ in your life, then I am telling you right now, don't expect heaven. It will hurt. Yes, it will hurt. But that is the truth. That is the truth. Now, look at the testimony of Paul. I once thought these things were valuable. What are those things? That is that he had. His religion before. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with what? With the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. Amen to that. You see, Paul considered everything worthless, rubbish, garbage. See, Everything is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Look at the testimony of Apostle Paul. He lived his life without Jesus Christ, but when he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, it changed everything. And he was willing to give it all up for Jesus. See? A new perspective in life. All things he loved and did, you see, those things did not give him the ultimate life satisfaction. And his life, he was living a life without Jesus. He thought that he was righteous. Yeah, he thought that he was righteous because he was a he was zealous in his old religion. But he was dead wrong. He was willing to try a different life with Jesus Christ in order to secure himself a place in heaven. Now then Paul said these incredible words. These words tell us of his undefying obedience, undefying faithful obedience to God. When he said, for to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Wow. How about that for a faith? How about that for a faith? See, and without any you know, shadow of a doubt, Paul, I, I believe, Paul has his place in heaven. Peter and the rest of the disciples, you see, they hid the stranger's voice, took on a, a different approach, and they were rewarded. They had a great catch. Then the disciple, let's continue on John 21, <clears throat> 7 and 9. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, <clears throat> towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals were there with fish on it and some bread. You see, success would be like this. That the glory of God would be revealed to us. You see, when we allow a sound reasoning, objectivity, humility, you know, to, to envelop us and take the course of our lives, the possibility of great reward is not far from behind. It is following you actually. When we listen to God and hear this call, the glory of God will be revealed to us in the future. You see, after the disciples heeded the advice of this total stranger, not only they were rewarded with a great catch, you see, Jesus revealed himself. Jesus revealed himself when Jesus said, it is the Lord. You see, And can you imagine the reaction of Peter and the apostles, they were all happy. Peter even jumped up the boat and into the water and tried to get to Jesus Christ. He was happy. He was ecstatic knowing that it was Jesus Christ. See? Now this uh, reassuring verses that I will show you,
is what reassures us of what will to come. What will come in the future if we will heed, take heed, and cling on to the faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. As we await with the blessed hope and glorious appearance of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He will be revealed to all of us. God will be revealed to you. You will see now the glory of our Lord and Savior with all its splendor. See, now we don't want to miss that, don't we? I don't want to miss that. See, God will be revealed in all its splendor. Now, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread in verse 9. And in verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Wow. Can you imagine? I can see Brother Joe smiling, Sister Faith smiling. Can you imagine? Come and have breakfast. Wow. I'm wearing this coat, but I can feel my, the goosebumps. <laughs> inside <laughs> really you see come and have breakfast can you imagine the surprise of the disciples you see Jesus made them breakfast wow wow you see how cool was that the Savior our Lord and Master preparing food and prepared food for his servants wow imagine after, you know, they, they were really, really tired. Whole night catching without fish, and then following morning, they went out so tired, they were so hungry. You know, seeing the fish being cooked, okay? and, and the bread, wow. And from afar, they can smell, you know, they can smell the cooked fish over the charcoal. Can you imagine their faces? I would be like, right? See? And what an invitation it was from Jesus Christ. Come and have breakfast. Now they are having a feast with the Savior. You can't get any better than that. You can't get any better than that. Friends, see, if you don't have Jesus in you, Jesus is inviting you to have breakfast with him. A feast with him. No, he knows you are tired. He knows you need rest. But unfortunately, we are just so stubborn to admit it. See, Jesus is inviting all of us. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. God has been constantly Constantly inviting us to have this wonderful journey with him, wonderful relationship with him. He wants you to have a breakfast, lunch, brunch, snacks, dinner, midnight snack with him. See, are you not excited to have a meal with God? I know I am. I know I am. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to that day. You see, have you noticed that last week and today's lesson uh, were the two recorded miraculous catches of fish in which Jesus Christ was involved in Luke chapter 5 and now in John 21. And in those cases, they sailed out to fish without Jesus and they weren't successful. But when Jesus was involved, they have a great catch. What does it mean? What does it mean? You can have all the material possessions, you know, success in life, and what this life could offer you. You can have money to buy boats, big boats. You can hire as many fishermen to work for you, but without any catch, without any success, without any fish, all the efforts you put in with your sophisticated you know boats fishing boats it is all for nothing right all for nothing it means without jesus 
all you have useless without Jesus your life is worthless I'm telling you that I'm telling you that as Solomon said it is just chasing after the wind in its vanity better one handful <clears throat> with tranquility you know one handful just enough resources to survive with peace tranquility with peace that comes from having God than two handfuls two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind you know with so much going on with your life working and working and working she had never satisfied keeping busy with family with work career but without God Solomon said this is chasing after the wind these are all useless so why not be successful while having God be busy with God. Have everything that you have with God. Many people have everything but without God. Life would be useless without God. Brethren and friends, see, true success in life can come if we just listen to God. If we have a teachable spirit taking on humility. And eventually take Jesus Christ and serve him the gospel is yours I hope that those who have not yet accepted the Lord will make the right decision today not tomorrow not later we're calling for you to accept the Lord and for all of us who accepted the Lord already be faithful continue in the faith love one another share the gospel and wait for that moment when Jesus said, come and have breakfast with me. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? God bless everybody.